All right. Good morning. Welcome. So good to have you all here with us this morning as we worship. Welcome those online as well. If this is your first time joining us, you are at St. Paul's Methodist Church in Williamsburg. So um, we're happy to have you. Um, a couple announcements as we get started. Next weekend, of course, uh, 4th of July weekend, our service here on Saturday night will be as normal. So 5 o'clock here for Saturday night. But Sunday morning is our service on the square. And so we will be joining with the Presbyterian Church over there. Um, we did not get to do it last year. But every year that I can remember, at least before that, we have... We have uh, joined together with them for a service. So that is 4th of July at 10 o'clock. Bring your lawn chair. Um, we'll set up in the park, and Pastor John will be doing the message that morning um, with uh, Pastor Dan and Bethany helping with that as well. So uh, that's next weekend. So we will not be here. And for those online uh, watching, there will not be a live feed for uh, next Sunday morning. So make note of that. Um, and then second, we have a second round of meet and greets that we're scheduling. We did this a year ago, or almost a year ago, uh, so people could get to know Pastor John. And there's still quite a few people that he has not met. And so we want to do a second round of those. We're also going to include Kelly Loftus, who is our uh, new congregational care director, in those meet and greets so that she can get to know you as well. So I have times that were sent out in our weekly update email. So take a look at those. Respond to her on, on scheduling that, and she'll get those uh, names put down. But um, if you've already done it and you want to do a second one, that's okay too. So you're welcome to join us for that. So, um, so we're just uh, happy and blessed to have you here. As we begin our worship this morning, I just invite you to stand. Your holy name, 
worship your holy name lord i worship your holy name let's pray this morning dear father we come to you this morning and we just lift up praise and thanks to you even when things are not always good in our lives lord you are always good and we just thank you for your perfection and your continued grace and love for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell Never alone. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I Let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for your presence in our lives, 
in large ways and small. And we ask that you would continue to teach us what it means to be faithful in all things. Help us to fill our lives with goodness and blessing so that we may in turn be a blessing to others and our families and our neighborhoods, wherever we go. We pray these things for the sake of your coming kingdom and in the name of your Son who proclaimed it to us, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, we are continuing our summer series on the book of Ezekiel. Why are we reading from Ezekiel, Old Testament prophet? Well, because he lived through some very extraordinary and and difficult times, and through that, God was with him, and in the midst of that, God helped him to find reason for hope. So it seemed uh, like a great message for all of us living in these times, and uh, that's why we're working our way through Uh, through the sections of this book this summer. So today we're finding ourselves in Ezekiel chapter 18. I'll be reading uh, parts of that chapter, verses 1 through 9 and 21 to 24. And I'd like to invite you to hear these words from the scripture. The prophet says, The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine, the life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. If a man is righteous and does what is lawful and right, if he does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman during her period, does not oppress anyone, but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry, covers the naked with a garment, does not take advance or accrued interest, withholds his hand from iniquity, executes true justice between contending parties, follows my statutes, and is careful to observe my ordinances, acting faithfully, Such a one is righteous. He shall surely live, says the Lord God. And if the wicked turn away from all their sins that they have committed and keep all my statutes and do what's lawful and right, they shall surely live. They shall not die. None of the transgressions that they have committed shall be remembered against them. For the righteousness that they have done, they shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, says the Lord God? Would I not rather that they turn from their ways and live? But when the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity and do the same abominable things that the wicked do, shall they live? None of the righteous deeds they've done shall be remembered, for the treachery of which they're guilty and the sin they have committed, they shall die. This is the word of God. Amen. Well, I wonder if you have ever heard of a man named Wilbur Scoville, who as a young fellow worked for the Park Davis Corporation as a chemist. While he was there in the year 1912, Mr. Scoville developed what he called the organoleptic test. Now, this was a scientific process to measure the chemical capsaicin, which is found in some foods. And this test, with a little bit of refinement, is still used today. You may know it as another name, the Scoville Scale, or by its measurement, SHU, Scoville Heat Units. And if this still doesn't sound familiar, maybe this graphic on the screen behind me will help. The Scoville test from 1912 until today was designed to measure the heat of certain foods. And I found this particular graphic at a place called chilipeppermadness.com where they helpfully show the Scoville ratings for all of your favorite spicy peppers. Now, it starts at the bottom with a rating of zero for the bell peppers that we all grow in our gardens and enjoy, and it goes up from there. At 2,500 to 8,000 Scoville units, we find the jalapeno. At 8,000 to 22,000, the serrano. And at 30 to 50,000, we find the cayenne pepper. At this point, most people stop and call it a day. But I know there are some who love the heat. 
In fact, I once worked with a woman who ate ghost peppers regularly. She would bring them in her lunch and then with a smile offer them to all of us who were sitting around the table. Of course, we refused. Now, she never told me what her uh, peppers were rated, but according to this chart, the ghost pepper ranks in at 800,000 Scoville units. And as you can see, the chart goes higher, up into the millions. Finally, at the very top is what Mr. Scoville set out to, re to measure more than 100 years ago. At 15 to 16 million units is pure capsaicin. Now today we're not actually going to talk about peppers and food that makes us, uh, that is hot and spicy, or recipes we can make with them. But I do, what, what I would like to do is call, is for you to call to mind the most spicy food that you ever ate, even if it was only a bell pepper. Now what I want you to remember is not so much the taste, but how you reacted to it. You may have made a little noise. You may have opened your mouth to get some air. You may have started to sweat. Your eyes may have watered. You may have looked around frantically for a glass of milk. Your limbs may have gotten just a bit shaky, depending on how hot it was. Now, besides the glass of milk, all of these responses are involuntary. They happen when our bodies encounter something so intense that it stops us in our tracks. Now, I'd like you to keep these sensations in mind as we shift our attention slightly to something else that can cause an intense reaction, and that is sourness. You can probably also remember the most sour thing you ever ate. It may have caused you to pucker your lips and tighten your throat, and your saliva glands went into overdrive. You may have also made a beautiful face. Now, I'm sorry to report that when I went to do research on this topic, I found that there is no Wilbur Scoville for sourness. No one has done a similar study and a similar uh, rating scale. Instead, what we have is a simple pH test, which you might remember from high school chemistry class. Now, pH measures things on a scale from number one being acidic to 14 being alkaline, with a pH of seven being neutral. And yes, I know there's a mistake on the screen. It should say 7.0 instead of zero. That's a typo. Now, the FDA tells us that we have uh, all kinds of foods with different pH uh, rankings, uh, very much toward the uh, acidic or sour side. When we taste it is the lemon and the lime at about two Cranberries, 2.3. Grapes, almost 3. Pomegranates, grapefruits, blueberries, pineapples. So as we get closer to uh, the middle, it goes down. And oranges, finally, nice sweet oranges, 3.69 to 4.34. Now when we compare this list with what the dentist tells us, that our tooth enamel can be eroded by things with a pH of greater than 4.5, it seems like our bodies know, don't they? If we suck on a lemon all day long, it's probably not good for us. So be warned. Now in the course of my research, I found an article by some folks from the University of Nebraska, Walter Reed Medical Center, and the Medical College of Georgia. And they were writing about something I'd never heard of before. It's called sensory-based dysphagia. In other words, people who have trouble swallowing. Now when I worked in a nursing home, we would see this occasionally in some of our residents. But this particular study was done with combat veterans, people whose trauma in war had caused them problems with things that we take for granted. What the researchers wanted to do was to help these folks. So what they did was mixed up a variety of liquids, neutral, sour, sweet and sour, and then they gave it to the participants in their study. What they found was that, that those uh, liquids that were sour cause their patients to swallow in a different way, almost involuntarily. And their conclusion was that such drinks, because of the reaction it caused, could help doctors treat these conditions and these problems in the future. Now, what these doctors and researchers have measured and are suggesting for their patients is probably something all of us know from trying to suck on a lemon slice or accepting a dare from our friend about how many Sour Patch Kids we can eat at once. Just as hot peppers and spicy foods cause our bodies to react, the same thing is true when we eat something sour. This, in fact, has been known for many, many years at least as long ago as 2,500 years ago, 
we find an ancient proverb that goes like this. When the parents eat sour grapes, the children's teeth are set on edge. Now, I've eaten some sour things in my life, but I don't know that I've ever had something that sour, that I ate it, and my children reacted and responded. In case you missed it, let me read from the beginning of our lesson in Ezekiel, because it's in these three verses that this proverb is quoted. And in fact, God has something to say about it. The word of the Lord came to me, says the prophet. What do you mean by repeating this proverb? The parents have eaten sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. So long as I live, says the Lord God, you shall no longer use this proverb in Israel. In verse 4 and following, God goes on to explain why. Because all lives are mine, the life of the parent and of the child. And it's only the one who sins who will die. Well, let's unpack this. First of all, we should note that in the ancient world, just as today, there is a tension between two kinds of responsibility. On the one hand, there is individual and personal responsibility, and on the other hand, there is collective and group responsibility. Generally speaking, people in ancient Israel had a strong sense of this second type, the collective. They held their community, they held the group in high regard. And they always wanted to act in such a way so that the group, the family or clan or nation would be upheld and strengthened. For this reason, fathers and mothers felt very responsible. They made it a priority to raise their children with this in mind. This is why we read in Proverbs 22, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Likewise, in Proverbs 4, listen, children, to your father's instruction. Be attentive so that you may gain insight. Do not forsake my teaching. Now, these are instructions for personal moral development, but they are always understood with the purpose of making the family, the clan, the people of Israel stronger. We see this in Deuteronomy 4, where Moses gives a charge to the people. He says, take care, watch yourselves closely, and neither forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and to your children's children what you've seen here on Mount Horeb, where you've received the Lord's commandments. Now these commandments, which we know as the Ten Commandments, have a collective purpose. Of course, they're directed to individuals, but they are designed to teach us how to treat each other. And in these commandments, we learn that each person is to love God and keep the Sabbath, to honor their parents, not to steal, not to covet their neighbor's things, and of course, all the rest. So when prophets complain that the community is acting immorally or with injustice, it is always to the group that they are speaking. The group must mend its ways. But of course, it's up to each person to decide how to do that together. So all through the Bible, all through the Old Testament, there is this tension, this interplay. The purpose of moral teaching is for the good of the community, and yet the focus of this teaching is on the individual. They're related and intertwined wherever we see them. Now this is what's going on in our lesson today. In Ezekiel 18, when God quotes this proverb about sour grapes, it is a short saying about community and family responsibility. But God goes on to say that this proverb should not be repeated over and over and over again, as if the people who are now suffering in Ezekiel's time bear no responsibility and have no control over their own future. Instead, God is interested in what each individual will do here and now, how they will act from this point onwards. What God is saying is that the people must not give in to fatalism. They must not blame their parents or their ancestors for their current situation, their current exile and suffering. Instead, they need to take responsibility for their own actions in their current situation. They must decide how they will act, and God will hold each of them responsible. Now, I think for us, this idea of personal responsibility and accountability, it doesn't sound that odd. As Americans, we've been raised with this value. Individualism is important. 
Our ideas about freedom, they're usually framed in terms of personal rights. We're very quick to defend anything we believe impinges on these personal rights, but perhaps we're less inclined to think about freedom as a collective endeavor. In many ways, I think we have an underdeveloped appreciation for the ways that our moral actions, our personal decisions, are intertwined with what's good for our neighbors, both near and far. So let's hold that thought for just a minute. Now, one last thing I'd like us to note about our lesson this morning before we move on is its place in the book of Ezekiel. For the past few weeks, we've been learning about the prophet's calling and about the situation he finds himself in in exile in Babylon. This part of the story is found in the first few chapters of the book. Today, however, we are reading these verses from a new section found in chapters 15 to 23. And if you were to read all of these chapters, one after the other, you'd find a series of speeches that Ezekiel gives uh, from God and for his people. Now, one thing I always notice about the Old Testament prophets is how they love to create a, a picture or an image in our mind. In this section, as you can see on the list behind me, Ezekiel describes a useless vine that produces no fruit. He describes a woman who is loved and given gifts by her husband, but doesn't appreciate them. He describes eagles that swoop down hunting prey, a family of lions, a a drawn sword, a city filled with blood, as well as these sour grapes that we're talking about. Now each of these pictures, these images, are meant to illustrate the condition of Ezekiel and his people. They are meant to communicate what God has to say to them and what God wants them to do about it. Now, I always think it's interesting how Jesus, when he teaches in his parables, he uses these same techniques of pictures and illustrations to make his point. And it's probably true that he was reading these prophets as we are today. Now, understanding this passage is important. Equally important is how we apply it. What do we do with this lesson, with these verses? What difference can it make for us? Well, it seems to me that the thing to pay attention to is those sour grapes. Ever since Ezekiel's time, more than 2,500 years ago, this idea of sour grapes has stuck with us, hasn't it? We find it here and there throughout history. In Roman times, about the time of Jesus, we find a fable called The Fox and the Grapes by Aesop. Now, Aesop's uh, fables are usually short stories meant to teach a moral lesson, but this particular one is so short, it's only two lines long. It goes like this. Driven by hunger, a fox tried to reach up and grab some grapes hanging high on a vine, but was unable to, even though he leaped and jumped with all his strength. As he went away, the fox remarked, You grapes aren't even ripe yet. I bet you're sour. I don't need you. Now, like any good story, it leaves us asking questions. Were the grapes really sour? How did he know? Or does this story, in fact, reveal more about the fox himself than it does about the grapes? And for us, what does it teach us about criticizing and putting down the things that we cannot attain? More recently, there is another place we find these same sour grapes. Interestingly, in a children's TV show, All of you who were girls in the 1980s probably recognize this toy. Her name is Sour Grapes. Of course, she's the sister to the Purple Pie Man, and she's part of Strawberry Shortcake's universe. Now, whenever uh, Sour Grapes meets Strawberry Shortcake and all her friends having fun and doing things, she always comes in with some mean comment, something snide, something cutting. It's like she wants to take part in what they're doing, but doesn't know how or she's so uncomfortable with herself, she's afraid to try to make friends and and to fail. As a character, sour grapes may have something to teach us about relationships, about the kind of people we want to or don't want to be. And by the way, if you'd like to recreate your childhood like I did last week with my plastic soldiers, this sour grapes doll is now on sale on eBay for $29.95 plus shipping. (laughs) She even comes with Strawberry Shortcake's tricycle. And don't ask me how she got that. (laughs) 
little more seriously, I want to ask us about our, our grapes. If we stop to imagine what it's like to taste an actual sour grape, we can do that, right? It creates this physical reaction inside us. We can feel it. Of course, today's lesson from Ezekiel isn't really about what we eat. Instead, it's about our role, our decision-making, about our own personal and collective morality. As good Americans, we likely see the truth and the wisdom in God's directions to Ezekiel about not quoting this proverb about sour grapes anymore. God wants the people to stop blaming others for their problems and to make a new commitment and good choices for themselves. Of course, this is an important part of who we ought to be. Our choices matter. Our decisions make a difference in the path our lives will take. And we ought to be wise about how we do this. So one thing our scripture lesson is teaching us is that it is possible to stop tasting our own sour grapes, whatever they may be. Our scripture lesson is teaching us that it's possible to break the cycle of bad habits that we may have developed over time. It is possible not to repeat the mistakes of our parents, to repair the fault lines of prior generations. We can, we should choose well and wisely, acknowledging who we've been, but also keeping our eyes clearly on the horizon of who we want to be. As we do this, we may have to take some steps that make us uncomfortable. We may have to apologize. We may have to forgive. If there are relationships that have been broken, so long as it's physically and emotionally safe for us to do so, it may be up to us to take that first step towards restoration and healing. I'm sure you'll note that each of these things are personal and individual choices. They're things that we can and maybe should do. But I want to be sure that we note the second piece of our lesson, which is that these personal choices are not only ever just about us. Despite what we may hear elsewhere, the Bible is very clear that we are always connected to each other. Therefore, we should always be aware of and thinking about how our individual actions help or harm our families, our neighbors, our fellow Americans, and others around the globe who are our sisters and brothers in God's great family. So as we take stock of our own situation in life, of our own moral choices, as we decide who we're listening to and what we're listening to that informs our knowledge and our decision-making, friends, let's make sure that we're thinking not only of ourselves, but also of others. It's the biblical thing to do. Finally, As Christian people, as followers of Jesus, we should remember that he has not called us to anger and division and bitterness. Jesus has not called us to repeat the patterns and sins of the past. He does not want us to continue to eat those sour grapes in our lives, whatever they may be. Instead, Jesus calls us to live a different kind of life, one in which we refuse to dwell on the sour things, one in which we don't hold on to the dregs of our old situations one in which the new sweet wine of his love is poured into new and malleable wineskins, Jesus gives to us a new way of life that brings with it freedom. Freedom to serve and help to transform the world around us for the sake of him and his kingdom. Now, if we're a bit concerned that these things are too hard to accomplish, if we find ourselves trying and then failing because we fall back into the ruts of old habits, if we're worried that we could never possibly change the world around us all on our own, well, that's true. We cannot. But the good news is we don't have to. If these tasks seem difficult, we should not despair because Jesus tells us we do not have to live our lives alone. Whatever we may seek to do, whatever we need to try, He is with us. And what's more, we're here together, connected by his love and growing together because of the work of God the Father in all of our lives. In John 15, Jesus says, I'm the true vine, my father, the vine grower. He removes branches in me that bear no fruit. And branches that do bear fruit, he prunes to make them bear even more. And so you must abide in me as I in you. Jesus also says that he is the vine. 
and we are the branches. And everyone who abides in him will bear must, much fruit. This is his promise. So no more sour grapes for us. Instead, we have a life of hope, a life of love, a life of sweetness that Jesus helps us to create with him and together with each other. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let's go ahead and rise as we close in worship today. And, uh, just a beautiful song about the goodness of our God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. whatever blessings we may receive, and there are many, I pray and hope that you will be willing and able to share them with the world around you. So go to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. Go in peace. In Christ's name, amen.